This is the Acer Aspire One D255, and I paid a full 40 bucks for this thing, which honestly might have been a little too much for this. This thing is very plasticky, sluggish, and screams at me every time I open up literally anything. It's hard to believe, but 15 years ago, this thing was completely normal to use. It was part of a full-on movement, one that started with a promise, but then ended with regret. You see, netbooks were supposed to change everything. Netbooks were supposed to be small, cheap, and good enough for basic types of uses. But then just a few years later, they just vanished from the market, replaced by tablets and ordinary laptops. And if you try to use one today, you'll probably understand why. So today, we're gonna go back in time to find out what went wrong with this thing. From the huge rise of netbooks to the very clunky fall. And what this piece of crap says about technology in 2025, this is a story about the netbook revolution. You see, before Acer, HP and Dell and literally everyone else jumped on the netbook train, there was a little thing called the EPC made by Asus. And people went pretty nuts over these laptops. It was small and it was cheap and that's what people wanted. It wasn't powerful by any means, but that was the point. This was the era where your average laptop would cost a grand. Your phone also couldn't even copy and paste. The EPC came out as a laptop that would cost you only $299, and it hit as soon as net access was exploding and when Wi-Fi was actually becoming a thing. And then suddenly, people didn't really need a powerhouse of a computer with things like a fancy GeForce graphics card, or a DVD burner, or even big storage amounts. If it loaded Gmail without blue screening, and yeah, Gmail was out in 2007 during the EPC revolution, it was good enough. People just needed something to use to get online, check emails, and maybe even make Skype calls. Rest in peace, Skype. So Intel sold the hype in these EPCs and gave birth to the Intel Atom, a chip lineup built specifically for this new category of computing. Low power, low cost, and yeah, low performance. It did fit the mission though, and it had just enough power to do the things that I mentioned before. And once Intel laid down the foundation with these Intel Atoms for EPCs, Microsoft stepped in too. You see, EPCs used Linux, which Microsoft wasn't very happy about. But they made deals with this use to license Windows XP for dirt cheap, but with strict hardware limits. But isn't it 2007? That's right around when Windows Vista and 7 were released. Unfortunately, the puny Intel Atoms these things came with weren't even powerful enough to run more than three programs at a time, with Windows Vista. So you're pretty much stuck on Windows XP, and even Windows XP ran like dog crap on these. Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, it was estimated that Microsoft earned roughly $15 for every netbook sold with Windows XP loaded on. You notice I used the term netbook instead of EPC, right? Well, it didn't take long for the name EPC to get replaced by something a little more common sounding and more generic. It was a mix of both notebook and internet formed together to make netbook. The word notebook had already been flowing around for years as a sleeker way to say laptop. But the word netbook gave it this very specific stripped down and more budget focused identity. And then by around 2009 to 2010, these things were everywhere. On shelves at Walmart, stacked in school IT cupboards and popping up on every back to school tech guide. Which actually leads me on to how schools took advantage of these. Schools absolutely loved these netbooks. Instead of spending $800 per laptop for each student, they could buy a fleet of netbooks and hand them out to students. And this all happened during the peak of the revolution of computing and the internet. So cloud-based services like iCloud or Google Docs were all coming out. However, there was an issue. These netbooks could handle those tasks, but often just barely thanks to Windows. These older netbooks did not like Windows. And if you were tech savvy enough though, you could probably get Linux installed on here. Now browsing the web and writing essays or even using YouTube technically worked, but slow loading times in white screens made the experience pretty frustrating. And then all of this lasted for a very short year or two. And then came the iPad. When Steve Jobs introduced the iPad on stage at the 2010 WWDC, it was pretty much just a warning shot to the entire netbook category. He even called them out on stage funnily enough. The iPad didn't run Windows, which people didn't enjoy too much on the netbooks. It was fast and a lot more lightweight and looked so smooth. Its battery life also completely crushed anything in the netbook aisle, and you could get all of that for only $499. So yeah, still more expensive than netbooks, but it was so worth it. And then by the end of 2010, Apple managed to sell over 7.5 million iPads. And people absolutely loved these iPads, and they still exist to this day, unlike netbooks. Netbooks, on the other hand, started looking real outdated very fast. While the iPad was getting much better application support, touch gestures, and even accessories. The iPad pretty much did everything netbooks could do, but 100 times faster. 
And then by 2011, Intel sort of dissociated themselves from the whole netbook thing. Netbooks had managed to cover themselves up as being known as slow and janky. Manufacturers also tried to fight back by adding touchscreens to the netbooks, notably the Toshiba Libretto W100, which was essentially an even smaller netbook that had half the performance of an iPad, but was double the price of an iPad. And another thing that killed netbooks were Chromebooks. But we'll talk about that in a moment. But in the end, netbooks slowly and painfully faded away into computing history right around 2013. Yummers. So now that we have that out of the way, let's check out the notebook I've got here. You remember this Acer Aspire 1 D255 at the start of the video? Well, this thing is a prime example of why netbooks faded out. So let's go ahead and get this thing all booted up. And so as you can see, we're on the desktop now and we've got the entirety of the orange box installed on this. We're going to test our Half-Life 2 along with Team Fortress 2 to see how they perform on this. Remember when laptops used to have their specs listed on like an actual sticker? This laptop literally has the exact sticker that lists the specifications. We're rocking an Intel Atom N45 with 1GB of DDR3 memory. That is actually abysmal. Alright, so let's check out Half-Life 2 on this laptop and see if it even launches, because I tried out Portal and it just crashes like instantly on launch. Alright, well we've got the Valve logo. We'll give it a sec, it's obviously running on a hard drive so it's gonna be a bit slow. It is still loading for some reason, I have no idea what it's doing. And I think it crashed. Well, that is not a good impression for the rest of the apps. I don't know if they're going to load or not. Now, I know I said Portal did crash, but let's just see if it launches. Alright, I think we're getting somewhere with this. And... Okay. Well, things are not looking great for this little netbook here. I can also hear the puny 250GB hard drive this thing has just clicking away doing nothing right now. Alright, well, I don't know if the episodes are going to load, but I am aware they are much more lightweight. So, let's go ahead and try those instead. Oh, we've got a different Valve man for some reason. I don't know who that person is. Alright, I'll be reasonable. I'll give it a full minute to load because this game is like 3 gigabytes. Alright, I'll give it another minute, you know. I've got, I've got some hope in this netbook. Alright, well all this laptop needed was another minute because the game loaded. I'm gonna go ahead and start a new game here. Alright, and let's see if that works. Alright, well I don't really know what to say right now, it's just not loading at all. It just does not progress anywhere further than this and it has been at least 20 minutes. So I suppose that didn't really go out so well either. Right, well, maybe Team Fortress 2 might work. I've got some hope in Team Fortress 2. I've got, I've got hope in everything, but I've got hope in Team Fortress 2. Let's see if this works. Right, well, Team Fortress 2 is the only game that actually loaded to the main menu. Now, I've already gone ahead and put the graphic settings down because no way in hell is this thing going to run at the highest shader detail. So, of course, there is no Wi-Fi on this laptop. There is Wi-Fi capability, but the driver is non-existent for this laptop. So I just want to see how the performance is. So I'm going to create a server and I'll let this load. It loaded? Holy crap. This thing actually loaded. We're like into the game. Let me just skip the movie real quick. It's actually drawing a 3D thing. Well, it's drawing a 3D thing at like 1 FPS, but it's something. This thing actually loaded unlike the other games that we've tried. Alright, well I'm gonna go ahead and use heavy. Whoa. It's actual. Oh, I did not mean to shoot. But we're in an actual map. Right, well, let me just remind you that we're at the lowest settings possible and this thing is very laggy. By no means is this playable, but it's playable at the same time, like, we're at 13 FPS, like, I can definitely kill somebody with this frame rate because it's not jittering or, like, freezing or anything like that. It's just running at a really low frame rate. And keep in mind, this is at 640 by 480 so we could try a lower resolution, maybe even 240p. But I am really surprised, like, even though it's running at a very low frame rate, it's working. Like, we're in an actual map right now. God, look at these textures. You can barely see the actual, like, texture. But you know what? I'm proud of this thing. It managed to load a 3D game. And playing with a trackpad does not help. You know what? Let's try Half-Life 2 Episode 1 one more time just to see if it works. 
I've got some hope this time. You know what, let's try out Half-Life 2 Episode 1 just one more time just to see if it works because it actually reached the main menu so it might just possibly work, you never know. <coughs> let's start a new game. I'm gonna leave this netbook here and I'm gonna give it a full five minutes to load because that is more than enough for this thing. Oh my god, all this laptop needed was five minutes. And a bit of hope. It's actually loaded. It is actually working like. I know this is a cutscene, but I think it's working. Alright, well, it's running at like 3 FPS right now. This is a very graphically intensive scene, I, I'll, if I'll be honest with you guys, but. Oh. Come on. Oh my god. This game looks like crap. Oh, it's running at like 3 FPS. You know what, I need to stop complaining because last time I started complaining with the Intel Compute Stick video, you guys started saying that I was expecting too much out of this thing and this thing is like, this thing has like half the performance of that Intel Compute Stick so I really should not be expecting much, I don't know why I'm complaining right now. Yikes, this thing, god this thing does not like gaming. You know what, I don't know what I was expecting. This thing is a netbook, it wasn't built for gaming. I don't know why there's a huge queue on the screen. For some reason the font is messed up. Alright, let's break these wood blocks. Oh, it's so bad. You know what, props to this display though. The colours aren't actually that bad. I have definitely seen more displays worse than the screen. The viewing angles are terrible, which is pretty typical of pretty much any Windows laptop, but they aren't too bad on this laptop, and once again, definitely a lot better than any HP laptop, I can assure you that. Alright, well this was Half-Life 2 Episode 1. There isn't really much to cover here right now, a lot of this game is based on cutscenes, well the starting bit is, but, but this should just give you a rough idea of how the performance is on this laptop. Okay and one more thing I want to try out on this laptop is the Windows Media Player visualizers on music. This was a thing that I used to experiment a lot with on Windows Media Player back when I used to use Windows 7 and Windows XP and I think this should be a nice way to end things off with this netbook. So I've got my copy here of Free Cheers for Speed Revenge. Let's go ahead and open up Windows Media Player. I'll just use the recommended settings. Ooh, we've got the classic Windows 7 songs that come with the operating system. I would try these, but I'm pretty sure they're copyrighted along with the My Chemical Romance album that I've got. So I'm not gonna play them for too long. So obviously I can't play the music due to copyright reasons, but we've got visualizations on right now and it's lacking quite a lot. Let me try a different visualization. Let's try bars and waves. Yeah, this one runs a lot more better. Let's try the battery. Ooh, these are what I'm looking for. This is really nice. I wish I could play the music right now, but this is cool. So yeah, that's pretty much it for our netbook. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it for our netbook. So in conclusion, it's insane how these netbooks are a full-on category that genuinely took over the tech world for a few years. I've said this before, but these things were everywhere, and for a small amount of time, I suppose they did work. They got people online, into documents, and onto YouTube, all for a cheap price. But as demands got heavier on the web and the competition got smarter, netbooks just couldn't keep up. Now one thing people do actually agree on with me is how Chromebooks pretty much grabbed the netbook torch and actually ran with it. Chromebooks keep that just enough and web first philosophy along with a lightweight operating system and relying on cloud services. But they ditched the headache of sludgy atom processors and terrible plastics. With faster boot times and actually decent battery life, and automatic updates and just enough horsepower to actually load things up, usually in under 5 seconds. Chromebooks proved that a laptop cheaper than the average netbook and was 10 times more powerful than a netbook was possible and practical. And no joke, Chromebooks are actually everywhere too and they dominate schools as well. Day by day, more of these Chromebooks landed to schools as the go-to laptop for Google Classroom. So yes, netbooks paved the way by showing there was demand for affordable and portable machines and Chromebooks continued the way for this. So cheers to the evolution and to knowing when good enough needs an upgrade. 
If you liked what you saw, then definitely consider subscribing and make sure you join the Discord server too. I'm still on my break, however, I wanted to get something out in May or by May since my birthday just passed. So, I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!